Hi everyone. So in this video, I'm going to go over the practice quiz one uh, for Organic Chemistry One Lab. I will note that a lot of these things say like explain. Okay, so I'm going to explain verbally, like talking, as opposed to um, basically writing it down the answer. All right. So I'll write down the answer if it's not explained, but if it is explained, I'll talk. All right. It says rank the compounds below in order um, from lowest boiling point to highest boiling point. The compounds have relatively similar molecular weights. Explain your prediction and be sure to include a brief discussion of intermolecular forces. So what you're going to notice as we go through this quiz is that um, this is all about the why. There are no questions on here like, um, for example, uh, what temperature did the um, ethanol boil out at? That kind of stuff. There's no like facts of how much ethanol you added or any of this kind of stuff that you need to memorize. What you need to understand is why. So in this case, we're asked to rank these things in terms of <coughs> boiling point based on their structure. And what you'll notice is they're all similarly sized molecules. So what we need to remember is the compound with the uh, highest intermolecular forces is going to have the highest boiling point, and the, com uh, the compound with the lowest intermolecular forces is going to have the lowest boiling point. So if you look here, we have an OH. So this is going to have hydrogen bonding, which is present when you have an OH or an NH. And the strongest intermolecular force here, which is the strongest intermolecular force, is going to be hydrogen bonding. So this has very strong intermolecular forces, so it's going to have a relatively high boiling point. If we look at hexane, we only have carbons and hydrogens. When you only have carbons and hydrogens, the strongest intermolecular force is going to be your dispersion forces. So this one's only going to have dispersion forces, and those are relatively weak intermolecular forces, and this one's going to have a relatively low boiling point. Then this one's in the middle. We have this C double bond O. This C double bond O is polar because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So since this has a permanent dipole, this one has dipole, dipole intermolecular forces. And this is going to be um, kind of intermediate between hydrogen bonding and dispersion forces. So this is a very brief explanation of intermolecular forces. You know, this is a 45 minute lecture, um, but this is a very brief explanation of it. So now let's say we want to rank them in order from lowest boiling point to highest boiling point. Well, the one with the weakest intermolecular forces is going to have the lowest boiling point. Specifically, hexane is going to have a lower boiling point, so it is less than pentanone. All right, pentan 3 ohm, technically, which is less than pentanol or pented tool to be technically correct. All right, so we're ranking these in terms of boiling point, but we're really ranking them in terms of intermolecular forces. Weakest intermolecular forces, intermediate intermolecular forces, and strongest intermolecular forces. All right, part B, which is based on the one that we just talked about. Um, the GC cr uh, chromatogram below is a sample of a mixture of compounds from part A above. Assign each peak in the GC cr uh, chromatogram and briefly explain your choices. So again, I'm going to explain the choices like by talking. I'm not going to write them down. Okay, so basically in a GC, we have time on this axis and some kind of signal on this axis. Okay, in our particular GC, it's picoamps. But the point of this is that this is the time. The compounds in GC elute, elute in order of boiling point. So if hexane is the lowest boiling point, the first compound to come out, in this case around you know 22 minutes, is hexane. The second compound to come out is the intermediate boiling point, in this case pentan-3-ohn. Dash dash and the third compound to come out is um, the last and uh, highest boiling point compound, which in this case is pentan dash two dash all, um, all. Okay, so the alcohol the um, comes out last. So basically, we have the alkane, the ketone, and then the alcohol. All right. Question two says. A student attempts to separate a mixture of four fictitious organic liquids by distillation. The boiling points were ranked as follows. A is less than B, is less than C, is less than D. So A is the lowest boiling point and D is the highest. Which liquid will be collected in the receiving flask first? Circle your answer. So that remember that in a distillation, okay, on this side, we have kind of 
the boiling flask and then we use a condenser this is all connected all right and it's connected in a different way than this but this is basically um, just a rough diagram and then over here we have our receiving flask so effectively what we do is we boil the solution it condenses here and then by gravity it falls into the other flask like so so in this case um the lowest boiling point compound is going to come out first because it's going to boil off first and it's going to condense over here first and fall over here first so since compound a is the lowest boiling point compound a will dis um will distill first all right, so in the previous question, we talked about a distillation apparatus, and I drew a really crappy picture. Um, here's a much better picture of a distillation apparatus. So here's the distilling flask where the lowest boiling point solvent is going to make it up here to the um, distillation head first, and then condense, and then by gravity just simply drip into what's called the receiving flask. You'll notice this is open because we never want to heat a pressurized container. So it says, what is the name of the setup shown below? This is a distillation apparatus. It's actually a simple distillation apparatus. And it says, is the thermometer positioned properly? Well, with the thermometer, we want to measure the boiling point of the, the fraction that's being distilled. So we actually want to keep the thermometer uh, bulb right up here, all right, um, right on the uh, neck here of this arm. So right where this comes, because this is where you're going to collect that fraction. So then you'll know the boiling point of that fraction. Said another way, you'll know the boiling point of the liquid that is being uh, collected into the receiving flask. So this is a distillation apparatus and the thermometer is not positioned properly because it should be right there at this intersection. That's where we want it. All right, number 10 says, the following data was collected from a GC chromatogram of borneol and isoborneol. Which compounds, borneol or isoborneol, is present in the higher concentration of the mixture and why? So what you'll notice here is we have a peak area, okay? We have a retention time and we have a boiling point. And what you'll notice here is that the retention time of the lower boiling point is uh, lower than the retention time of the higher boiling point. We don't need to know that to answer this question, but that was a couple of questions ago um, that that would have been useful information. In this case, what we care about uh, to determine which one is in greater quantity is the peak area. So this is the area under the curve of the chromatogram and the software integrates this for you. So here we have have the peak area of the borneol is around 50,000 and for isoborneol it's around 16,000. This means that we have more borneol than isoborneol and the choice is answer letter D. Borneol, because it has the largest peak area, is in the largest concentration. Okay, if it asks us which one came out first, that would be by retention time and the reason would be because of the boiling point. But it asks us which one is in greater quantity, so that's based on the peak area. All right, it says rank the following solvents in order of increasing uh, polarity and then circle your answer. So if we look here, this can be a little bit challenging, okay? So we have hexane and toluene, okay? Both of these only have dispersion forces. But it's important to remember that um, aromatic rings are slightly more polar than um, than alkyl chains okay and i'm not going to go into detail about the reason of that um, but these are slightly more uh, polar than these alkyl chains but then we look at this molecule here and this has a, a polar bond here and a polar bond here so this one's polar and it has dipole dipole forces and then finally the water has hydrogen bonding so it has the strongest intermolecular forces and therefore the strongest um, polarity. So this is basically um, what we're looking at. Another way of thinking about this is the carbon oxygen bond is less polar than the hydrogen oxygen bond, okay, which is um, more based on polarity than it is intermolecular forces. So in this case, um, the hydrogen has less electronegativity than does carbon so this bond is less polar than this bond these ones you just kind of have to remember and it has to do with the hybridization of these atoms um but basically uh an alkyl chain is less polar than a um, aromatic ring so if we look here these are actually right in order this is the least polar this is the most polar so it's just a b c d because we want them in order of increasing first and this is the least on this side and this is the most on this side so they're right in order a b c d which is choice letter a
All right. It says, consider the rank polarity of a group of fictitious compounds with various functional groups is A is greater than B is greater than C is greater than D. So A is the most polar and D is the least polar. So the most polar is A and the least polar is D. Which compound will elute fastest out of a uh, packed column with silica gel with toluene as an eluent? So this is this molecule right here, which we talked about before, it's methylbenzene, um, is slightly more polar than hexane, but this is really nonpolar. So I'm gonna use my poor drawing skills again. All right, we have some kind of um, column, okay? We have silica gel as our stationary phase, and then we are running um, toluene eluent through this uh, silica gel. So silica gel, the stationary phase, is very polar. It has a bunch of OHs on it, and these OHs are very polar, and it can attract polar things. Toluene, which is flowing through this column, or the mobile phase, all right, so this one is the mobile phase, and this one is the stationary phase, the toluene, as we just talked about, is very nonpolar. So compounds that are nonpolar are not really going to stick to the silica gel, and they're going to go through the fastest. Compounds that are very polar are going to stick to the polar silica gel more, and they're going to go through the, co the column slower. So it, w it asks us which will go down the fastest, and that would be the least polar, which in this case is compound D. So yet again, after my terrible drawing, we get a nice picture of column chromatography column. So again, here you have a nonpolar mobile phase alluding through the polar silica gel. So polar compounds stick more and nonpolar compounds stick less. So it says a student separates compound A and B shown in gray in the diagram. So one of the compounds is here and one of the compounds is here uh, using a column chromatography column packed with silica gel, polar, and toluene, nonpolar, stationary phase, mobile phase, as the elution solvent. Compound A is known to be more polar than compound B. The following diagram shows the results after only 40 milliliters of toluene was eluted through the column. So if we look here, the more polar compound is still stuck in the silica gel because it has a strong affinity for the silica gel and a relatively weak affinity for the toluene, so it does not flow through fastest. So this is gonna be the more uh, polar compound. Compound A is known to be more polar, so that is compound A. Compound B is known to be less polar, and it actually went all the way through the column. So the first fraction is just toluene. The second fraction is toluene and compound B. And then the third fraction, we're still getting the toluene out and probably need to add a more polar solvent like ethyl acetate to push this out. Okay, so that's basically that. So it says identify the lo location of compound A and B in the diagram above by writing the letters A or B next to the location in the diagram. So we did that. Briefly explain uh, why you chose the location for compound A and B and be sure to exclude uh, include a discussion of polarity as it relates to this experiment. So we did that. The more polar compound A is more attracted to the polar silica gel, the stationary phase, and the less polar compound B is less attracted to the polar silica gel. So therefore, it eludes through the column more quickly. All right, let's look at the next one. After a student finishes um, eluding the column, they spot the colored fractions on a TLC plate, but forget to label their spots before eluding the TLC plate. Identify compounds A and B on the TLC plate and calculate the RF value for each spot. So remembering that A is more polar, the TLC plate works exactly the opposite as the, um, as the, um, uh, the column chromatography column. Now you have silica gel as a stationary phase, but in this case, the solvent moves up instead of moving down like it does through a column. So since the solvent moves up, the spot that moves less far is more polar, in this case, A, and the spot that moves further is less polar, in this case, B. Why? Because this time they're moving up. And the RF is basically the relative distance okay, um, that the spot moves versus what's called the solvent front. So up here, this is the solvent front. So this is how far the solvent moves. And the RF is always between zero and one. Zero would be it doesn't move at all, it's very polar. And one would be 
um, it moves all the way through. It's very nonpolar. So that's basically how this works. So for A, the RF is going to equal the 2.4 centimeters, um, the distance that A traveled, divided by the 5.7 centimeters, the distance that the solvent traveled. And when you do that math, you get a number. One second. You get uh, 0 0.4. Two. Okay, for the second compound, B, we can calculate the RF, and this time B traveled 3.9 centimeters, and the solvent traveled 5.7 centimeters still, because that's the distance between here and here. And when we do that ratio, we found it's 0 0.68. So you'll notice these are not perfectly. Um, uh, aligned, all right, because this doesn't look like it traveled 42% of the way up. It should be more like right there, okay, um, and that's just a mistake on my part, but still mathematically we can calculate them in this way. So this is how we would calculate the RF. So again, the TLC plate is basically the upside down column chromatography column, but also remember that the TLC plate is good for um, identifying things. Um, <clears throat> And the column chromatography column is better for, you know, bulk samples. So we would use this for to collect a bulk of A and B separate from each other. We would use this to analyze it. And in fact, the last part of this question is, what should the student do to confirm the identity of the compounds in each fraction? That would be a loot known A and a loot known B and make sure they have the same RFs as the unknowns. So if you elute a known A, it should still have an RF of 0.42 matching the unknown, and if you allude a known B, a, a, you know, a sample of what you know to be B, um, then it should have still the same RF. So this, in this way, it can be used for identification as long as you know roughly what's in the um, what's in the uh, mixture. All right. Last question says, a mixture of cyclohexanol boiling point 81 degrees C and toluene boiling point 111 degrees C um, are needed to se needed to be separated and collected without jeopardizing the purity of each compound. What is the best best method to isolate and collect each compound? So in this case, um, the boiling points are less than 60 degrees apart. So if the boiling points are less than 60 degrees apart, fractional distillation is the best answer. GC is used for analysis, not for separating bulk compounds. So GC is not a good method to separate ever. Simple distillation won't work here because of the close differences in boiling point. And the TLC um, uh, here um, may separate these based on polarity. But again, this is an analysis method. It's, you know, at a TLC plate, you're only going to get a few milligrams of the compound at best here and here. Plus, these are liquids, so they're going to they're going to dry up with your solvent anyway. So the TLC is not good for this uh, particular uh, case. So separating these by boiling point, it makes the most sense. You'll notice that chemists have tons of methods of doing things. That's because different methods work for different things. And in this case, um, that works. The interesting thing here here is these are similarly sized molar mass molecules. Cyclohexanol is an alcohol, so it has an OH and has hydrogen bonding, but it has a lower boiling point than toluene, which is um, which is uh, going to be uh, just carbon and hydrogen. And this again has to do with those um, aromatic rings and the fact that they can interact with each other and have strong intermolecular forces with other molecules which have aromatic rings. Again, I'm not going to get into the details there because it's uh, too long of a discussion for this, but it is um, you know just an interesting fact. So unfortunately in chemistry, there are so many uh, nuances to all of the rules that it just takes time and experience to get used to those things. But for this case, the, we want to use fractional distillation because their boiling points are less than 60 degrees, which is a fairly uh, straightforward type of rule. So I thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful and good luck on your quiz.